to be or not to be suffering. Maybe to be and not to be suffering at the same time, which is what you just proposed. Uh, the, the honesty of that uh, predicament is pretty much a normal reality that m maybe many peeps aren't owning up to in a sense. So we can say then that uh, when it comes to losses or the perception of losses, that ordinarily is primarily an emotional thing. And the head, I would just call it as if it were separate, <laughs> like your separate head sees it as, uh, oh no, everything is cool. Because life is life and everything comes and goes. And so of course, your intellectual understanding like everybody else's can arrive at some kind of neutral acceptance of it. Oh yes, of course. We, we all live to die, we're all born to die, and so on and so forth, so everything is transitory. <clears throat> True. Right. It's also fact, right? Nature. Things appear to disappear. But we're, we're not uh, always designed to allow things to disappear that easily, <laughs> whether that's money or anything of ours. <laughs> even though our body is going to disappear completely, totally, radically at some point. See? We're going to be gone. In fact, I'd like to assume that we're already gone. See? <clears throat> and that's good practice. Yeah. And so the idea that you have concluded that people should be free, and I think that's a good start. And in tr certain traditions, anyway, I was going to say many traditions, it could be many traditions in different languages, but the, uh, the practice of the heart is to liberate all beings. Okay? So that's the emphasis, because <clears throat> the theory of that is one thing, but the command is to liberate all beings. That's just out there, just liberate all beings. That's like the messianic, say, Realization. All beings need to be released from karma. They need to be liberated. Okay. On another level, all beings are already liberated. So who's there to liberate? Okay. We're getting back to the fundamental or fundamentalist viewpoint. All beings are here to be liberated. They're not liberated yet because it's obvious many beings are suffering. We can see it. We can feel it. We can hear it. So we know it. But we don't know that as a final condition, therefore the ultimate condition is that all beings are already liberated. Everyone's going to die, everyone's already entering various stages of liberation as it is, presently. In other words, bondage and liberation is a natural process. It's not a psychologic process. It has nothing to do with psychology and interpretations and all these sort of self-games, image games. It just is that way. Things come to go. We have to be completely resolved in understanding our purpose as humans is to allow this process to be what it is by itself, as itself, in itself, for itself. In other words, there's nothing bad about leaving or coming. Yeah. There's nothing inherently painful about coming and going. Huh. So how does the self make itself? Huh? That's really the question. Huh? How does the self get away with <laughs> making it so heavy? Say, and we're talking about ancestral influence, going back to river of blood karma. Yeah. You don't want it to be that way, but it is that way because your emotions are not your own. Your body's not your own. <clears throat> the earth is not your own. Your life is not your own. Your life belongs to the universe. <clears throat> so when we have an ancestry where that is really a, a powerful force, possession, See, and control is a powerful force, then there is suffering. That's like trying to keep a tree. You can keep it. The tree doesn't belong to you, or the air, or the wind, the elements, nature. We can use these things, but we can't control these things in a manner of speaking. See, you can cut grass, but you're not controlling the process of growth. You're just cutting grass and assuming that's yours. 
being a farmer and picking, your, let's say, your produce, taking your produce, see, that's not nature itself. That's just product. See. Stuff that you can more or less take from the earth and use for your own purposes, let's say. But the reason why you take it is to sell it. See, so to give it up. See, you want to exchange it for something else. That's nature. The exchanging is nature. Okay. So when we're talking about the loss of peeps, if that's what this is about, there is no loss of peeps. <laughs> there may be a real loss of peeps if both peeps understand that there's a loss. And there may be a loss because it's an agreed upon loss. So it's a mutual delusion of, of loss. <clears throat> and found. Because if it losses, there may be finding something. Losing and finding, basically the same. Yeah. Did you lose something to find something else? Maybe if you are destined to have something else, you have to lose something in order to find it. So, yeah. so to, to uh, approach this scientifically, then you have to talk to the emotions, I would say psychically speaking. You have to talk to these emotions that are begging to be trained because they stand in the way of your admitted reasoning and intelligence to the contrary. So that could be relative to anger, lust, uh, attachment, vanity, so greed, any of the most powerful and potent negative emotions that we have, that we, we are to a certain degree. That means we, we are, as humans, commissioned to use these as wood for the fire from the point of view of a school of enlightenment so that nothing stands in the way of what it is that you're here to do in fact mm -hmm. that is to say nothing from the ancestral line that is a negating force relative to your creativity now i'm not going to say that absolutely anger is bad no anger is useful so we need to know how to use it Attachment is useful. It's great. All of these are given to use intelligently to enable us to produce, let's say, momentum, creatively speaking, on the path that we are on or the path that we are trying to get on. So what is that? We're talking about exchange. Okay. Rates of vibration. Huh? Differing rates of vibration or rates of exchange. Everyone is on a different wavelength. Sometimes we're not gracious enough to allow that to be the case. When you know, in fact, that you're violating another person because you're imposing yourself on the person or, let's say, holding them back by wish of, let's say, the desire to have them as your property or whatever, that's a violation, so you're paying for it. You feel the pain of that yourself. So when you let go of that and you feel the peace of, of allowing a person to have their being, see, compassion, being and allowing to be. Okay. Heart spaciousness. Okay. Say, well, this is good, but I have to give it up. Or it wants to go. It's not like a guitar. You know, a guitar is, ah, you know, somebody offers you a good price. Ah. It's not like that exactly. This is a being that says they need to be somewhere else. That you have to allow them the space to be somewhere else. See? And then that tests your idea. And it challenges your idea of love. Because if you love, then you, you want the other person to be happy, really. I mean, unless we're talking about a savage level of love. Yeah. You are mine! And if you leave, I'm going to pull your hair out! <laughs> and drag you around the street. <clears throat> At worst, have you stoned, because you're my property, right? Like barbarians do. That's some kind of punishment. As if anything, really, is worthy of that. Short of, you know, what is it? Some horrific crime against humanity, maybe, you know, and, and the earth. Maybe. So we have to look into the origins of these emotions, and you don't find them in yourself. If you, you find them like this, they're circulating through you. They arise, it's more intense one moment, next moment it's gone. So you're already being informed by it that it's delus delusory. It's fleeting, it's coming and going. It's not who you are, it's what's coming through emotionally in a waveform. So you don't, you don't have to obstruct it in a manner of speaking. You have to understand it. 
understanding it, letting it have its reality, but letting, letting you have your reality, which is to be free of that. So not impeded by that or obstructed by these things that, as I say, are kind of like dogs begging to be trained, being put to better use than that higher use. So it has nothing to do with the other person. If in fact they, uh, they choose to, or know that they need to be somewhere else for, for who knows a personal reason or uh, something that they are moving with inside themselves, that is their own path. So you got to give them the freedom to find their own path just as you have an opportunity to find and walk your own path. So now getting to another relevant point, and that is you just completed, or you are in the process of completing your Saturn return cycle. So Saturn return cycle implies disciplines <clears throat> and assuming disciplines because there are opportunities that come with the pressures of Saturn from the years of 27 through the 30th year. Okay? The build up. So you're forced to let go. You're forced to consolidate or organize yourself or pull yourself together, integrate yourself as an individual. And that is a companion, particularly, but as an individual. See? Then you're going back to your birth time, which sets this up. You have to understand these forces are benign and then they are devastating depending on who's clinging to what in the process. Yeah. Having a foreknowledge of this, you, you can flow through the changes and not have to blame anybody. The whole purpose of, let's say, time mastery is to liberate every, everyone from blame because you're dealing with your own time patterns. You were born to experience these things and it has nothing to do with anybody else except Coincidentally, when you're going through your changes, there may be one person or more people around you to blame if that's your tendency. If you can't face it as something you created, then you, you may as well just blame them to make yourself feel good. Because you don't want to be responsible for yourself. And this is true of anyone. Comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... the kind of repeated and insistent level that this is coming in at is, is surprising. You know? Well, okay. Pardon the interruption. We're, we're talking about cycles. Yeah. Cycles, which prove my point that has nothing to do with a person. All oh, right. Absolutely nothing to do with the person. This has to do with your person and what you allow to either use you and abuse you. It could be uh, a uh, lost for you know, sexual, uh, let's say, pleasure or perversion, let's say, depending on a person's, let's say, needs. Or it can be attachment to various things. It could be food, which is very much on the same par with these things, liking and disliking, preferring a certain kind of food, imagining you need it because the food is designed to appeal to your taste more than your, your health. Cigarette smoking, alcohol drinking, these things that are maybe in small measure harmless, but to a, a degree of, let's say, addiction can be harmful. See? See? And again, all of this has to do with a person's recognition that if they can get to this recognition, that what arises is begging to be trained, put properly in its place. Now, very few people understand that. Very many highly disciplined people understand that. Many creative people understand that. But many, many uncreative people don't understand that. And they're content to just be with their passions and their stuff without changing anything. And that's their prerogative. That's their way for now. Until a crisis or something really powerful happens to shock them into understanding, hey, you have health to be responsible for. Because you're not out here by yourself. You have family, you have friends, you have relatives. And when you go down, everybody goes down with you. Why do you want to do that? Oh, it's your choice, so why not just drag everybody down to the pits of suffering and hell and whatever? Do yourself in. Who cares? If you don't care, who cares, right? No, everybody cares. Everybody feels it. So then you have as much an obligation to lift people up as well as to drag them down into your despair and your desperation. See? Which, who put you there? Who, who put you there? Yeah. <clears throat> So, uh, you mentioned putting something in its right place, using this stuff as um, 
wood for the fire, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess how does how does one, especially with something this intense, yeah, it's intense and and frequent. (laughs) So you put it away and it comes back right away. But this is your machinery. Yeah, it's not anybody else's machinery. Sure, this is arising in your body and to your mind. So it's causing you the the disturbance. See, so we're talking about ancestral. It's deeper than just you know, theory, no, it's a powerful force. You got to deal with this. This is inheritance. I have to call it inheritance, not merely innate, it's inheritance. Because in my scientific research, talking to peeps and, and, you know, I guess relatives of peeps, I found that there's definitely continuity here. From being, and and generation to generation is continuity. In other words, it's unfinished business. We see the thing repeating itself, the problem being repeated in life after life until it is recognized and corrected, if it can be, or used properly, and thus transformed into something good, and then it, it now produces a good karma which others can properly and appropriately duplicate and follow through, whether that's good business instincts or good musical instincts or good creative instincts across the board, good military instincts, good business instincts, whatever it is. Right. Putting it to use, putting it to public service. And these could be considered hauntings. Like you, you, we could say that's a haunting. You feel, you feel this thing in you, like, like people feel things around them, and they don't know where it comes from, they don't know why it's arising, but something for you to confront, not avoid, deny. You have to confront it. You have to absorb it, and then put it to good use. Say, okay, I have this now, what can I do with it? Maybe you need to play music with it. Maybe you need to go riding a bike with it and say, yeah, now I'm going to ride the bike to free myself of all these negative emotions. Maybe that's your, your purification. Mm-hmm. And that's a way of working with it and recognizing it as fuel. Fuel for the fire. Okay. And it's not directed at anybody and it's not uh, related to anyone but you. Because it's in you. And when you have obsessive people, then they want to kill the person. See? Because they, they, don't, they can't handle, they don't recognize it as being owned. Own. It's own. O-W-N. It sources right there. Own. It's your own. See? You are its own. <laughs> You're its vessel. Yeah. And we're here to purify all of that. Recognize and purify. It's not about being at war with it. No, you have to understand what it is. It's, again, dog begging to be trained so as not to destroy itself or its master. Mm-hmm. A very easy process. And we have to see it down the line. Yeah. Alcoholism was in my line. And I saw it right up front. Okay. Mm. And I chose not to be that. Because it was in my blood, I could feel it. I had a taste for alcohol. I liked it. I thought, mm, this is good. But I saw the results. And I put the two together. I said, they all like it too, but look at them fighting. I thought, mm, not that anyone has to drink to that extent. But that was my laboratory at home in the kitchen, where booze was the solution. And it was no solution. Small comfort, in small quantities, unabused, but abused, devastating, horrific. So, use it properly. Love always you. Uh, in reflecting upon the former conversation, it should be said that when a particular friend or associate gets up and walks away, you know, for good reason in their mind, uh, that's very different from, let's say, a loss of higher magnitude. Because we can say maybe that debt, whatever the debt was that brought the people together, it's is handled already, it's complete, so boom, they're gone. There's no problem, there's no looking back, there's no turning back, or there's nothing there. It's finished. When we're talking about other kinds of losses, 
They're much, much more complicated than that, especially losses of relatives. It's really, really complicated. See, those losses can be all consuming because there's so much unfinished business and it's so close to home. It's really inside you. So those losses are much harder to navigate in terms of getting beyond them. They're, that's no easy laughing matter in some cases. Some other cases, yeah, it is. But uh, we have to be careful with uh, trying to formulate, you know, any kind of generalization about losses. Yeah. Now, getting back to Saturn, <clears throat> as an indication of a maturation process. So, discipline is something that is there with certain people. For better and for worse, I've been a very dif disciplined, focused person. For my purposes, that is my destiny. It's not like I want to be that way, it's just something that happens. Yeah. It's not that a person has it in them to want to be that way. It's something beyond that. Say, say something coming from the core. So let's say, for instance, regarding Saturn, it, it gives people an opportunity to gauge themselves. So it could be theoretical, but it has been something that, which has been handed down for thousands of years. It's something observed by a very, very astute scientist, say, star watchers, stargazers, and so on, who have watched both the stars and watched the effects on human nature. In some cases, there's more of a psychic connection and there's more a spirit connection where people are informed. I mean, they have geniuses uh, whisper in their ears. They say, okay, this is so. No, uh, these days, they're extraterrestrials. <laughs> it's all about the extraterrestrials. Everything is blamed on the extraterrestrials. Uh, and so, be that as it may, wherever it comes from, we're talking about however it gets to us, wisdom pertaining to the maturation process from let's say, childhood to manhood or womanhood. And so with Saturn, we're talking about a midlife process. Saturn takes about 28 years to uh, orbit the sun, 28 more years, 28 and a half, whatever it is, approximately this and that, with its retrograde motions and zigzagging, whatever else. And so we can use that as a guide. <clears throat> There's a numerological implication here, which goes back to a Pythagorean uh, theorems, Regarding the divinity of numbers, you know, scientists are always working with numbers, and without that, where would, where would Einstein be, right? So the whole thing is, is really related to how the intelligence works. The human intelligence is able to mathemati mathematize, let's say, uh, and uh, numerologically utilize various sort of symbols to come to certain conclusions relative to the laws of nature and, and facts of the universe. Again, as in the case of Einstein, who was also somewhat mysterious and intuitive. He, he didn't you know, say it was all about his thinking. Uh, he said it was more about his meditative, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, use of his mind, see, going into these uh, states of meditation, see, working with his mind, see, states of consciousness. Uh, this could be the, the, the fact for many geniuses who say, no, they have to take a nap here and there, and then they see things and they go into states of consciousness. And so, however we got the knowledge from the ancients, geniuses or scientists or mystics, whatever, uh, we have a system here that by the time the 30th year comes, which is Saturn's first cycle, uh, which repeats itself two or three times in the case of some people's lives, uh, 28 and 56 and then beyond that. <clears throat> then we're talking about a maturation process. We need to gauge where we have matured. So, to what we have matured into at that point, which means that assuming there was appropriate discipline, then you're not going to be shaken off your path by the time the 28th or 29th year occurs. Now, in the case of Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison, they all died during their Santa return cycle. They couldn't handle the pressure because the pressures were mounting because they were arriving at a plateau where they were going to be at that place for the rest of their lives, like or the rest of their to say their time here, whatever that is, could be. If we're talking a full life, then maybe 60 years, 70 years, whatever. In this case, we're saying, yeah, plateau from 30 years on. You reach a plateau there. So you rise up from childhood to that level of mastery, and then boom, and you have something stable working for you. And of course, depending on what your karma is, you're going to have your bumps and your bruises in any case, depending on what your choices are. So that's a leveling off phase. And it's a good phase. When my Saturn return, which is a good 
I guess you might say reference to, to know what I'm talking about. I went through a Saturn return cycle and by the time I was 27 and a half, all kinds of changes occurred. Divorce, ran into Pharaoh Sanders at that point, okay? which meant something was being unloaded in order to take something on, to complete something, so that by the time I was 29 or 30, I had already achieved a level of mastery, at least being able to play with Pharaoh at his level, we have to say there's some, maybe, maybe some mastery there, yeah? uh, that I have been able to maintain and sustain since then. Yeah. Pretty much a plane, a plateau, a plane of functioning operation, having trained myself, so to speak, or been moved to or driven to, to get to a certain level, and that's the proof that I can use relative to this particular phenomenon. See, that is the effect of Saturn in terms of its 28th year first cycle of return. And so we're talking about opportunity then, because discipline creates opportunity. It's also ha it also has a connotation of being uh, like the master, in a sense, because it relates to Capricorn, which is the 10th house, and the uh, universal uh, element, uh, the universal level of the element of the physical world. Capricorn, yeah. attainment, say, extreme attainment. Yeah. We have the four universal signs, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, and each one of those is the extreme version of the element in terms of the theory of time mastery. <clears throat> Capricorn, physical attainment, materialism. Before that, Sagittarius, understanding, wisdom. Direction, Aquarius, knowledge, and distribution of knowledge, see? sharing, see? brotherhood, see? spiritual community, yeah. uh, the galaxy is a spiritual community, yeah. and intercommunication with all, it's a mental sign, uh, well, air sign, so I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, something related to all levels of intelligence then. And Pisces, more heart basis, compassion. See, you know, Aquarius, another level of wisdom distribution. And maybe not like Sagittarius, a direction to, but maybe Aquarius realizing it and distributing it. And then we have Pisces as compassionate, yeah. all compassionate. Yeah. The heart opening, Aquarius mind opening. I'm saying that this is a theory. Okay. And uh, Pisces saving people having the knowledge and then maybe walking with the people, saving the people, helping the people. Okay? Again, theorem. And so there's something to this science that is very useful. And Saturn is just one of the major considerations okay? and that is very, very uh, easy to follow and study. Go to people and ask them, what were they doing between the years of 27 and 30 years of age? And say, were you going through a heavy life-changing crisis at that point, and usually they say, yeah, and then you find a lot of people pass through that time anyway. They're passing all the time. But there's a peculiar kind of implication there between the 7th and 30th year. Okay. My father passed during that time. Yeah. He passed during his Saturn return cycle. I was a child. Yeah. And I learned from that. I was present. So then time has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Not peeps, but time. I bring this up because we are subject to time. The whole universe is, is a time machine, which is, let's say, something that I have described it as. It's a time machine. We are space beings in this time machine that come from the visible universe and the invisible universes. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you don't sense that yourself, then this means nothing to you. If you think you're your body and that's all you've got, then that's your prerogative. That's your state of consciousness. That's as much as you know. So when you, your body dies, you are just dead and that's it. So I'd say we're already dead, right, to what it really is, until we, it, it is obvious to us that what it is, is what it is, right? in terms of the radiance and the radiant nature of life. See, beyond form, see, beyond mind, yeah. Yeah. beyond self-thought, and so on. Mm. 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 Yeah. 
So can we say that there is a uh, Saturn return cycle crisis? Yes, there's a crisis. You can call it that. Uh, because it's like before it and then there's an after the Saturn return. Uh, you know, it's like the BC and then the AD. Uh, or uh, BS before Saturn and then the AS after Saturn. So we can say that Saturn really tries to clear the field and thus becomes the force that it is recognized esoterically to represent, and that is opportunity as a result of discipline, and maybe even more discipline for more opportunity. See, embracing discipline as a means to attainment. Yeah. And that's it. You, if it is real for you, in the, let's say in the language of the ancients, then that's really related to the path of self-mastery, not just occupational mastery. But that's where it really counts when we're talking about self-mastery self-realization so you take you look at all your neuroses all your wild animals beasts and hauntings and ghosts and you put them you put them properly together and say hey listen i've enjoyed you so it's been quite a run but i don't need you anymore i got work to do now so hey hit the road let's go all right i'm not entertaining you i'm not uh, hosting you anymore get out of here boom get to work Question. <laughs> I had one before you said that. Good. <laughs> um, maybe I can remember it. Kind of blew it out. Um, so this is new beginning. Saturn's done its purification work. It's cleaned up work. What's the fuss about? <laughs> it's what it is. But it it's clear. Now it's time to move. Okay. Be open. Okay. Continue. Whatever it is you have to do. Practice. Managing your business. Yeah. Continue your study of life. Yeah. Yeah. In the ways of practice. Yeah. Yeah. You used the word discipline a bunch of times in the last minute mm -hmm. or two. And mm -hmm. You also used the word focus. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes one and the same thing, other times not. You can be focused on a television set. You have to wonder whether or not that's a discipline or some kind of obstruction. Mm. Right. Discipline means you're pu putting it, you're integrating something. You're gaining power. Discipline is, I, I'm saying the way I would use this, is to gain power, see, to gain some kind of sanity. Discipline in this sense doesn't mean military sanity or insanity, but it means more psychic, spiritual, intelligence, creative sanity in a sense. Right. Opening yourself up beyond the obstructions, beyond the hauntings, beyond the neuroses, right? which you can also use. There's no question about using it. But then there's more, there's more space that we need to access beyond the, the, the disturbances, the noises, and the echoes from the past, the memories. We have to get beyond memory to use some memory, but get beyond memory, because where we're talking from now is no memory in the way. All memory is good. No memory is in the way. Okay? Self is good, but no self in the way. Okay? Thought is good, but no thought in the way. People great, but no people in the way. Okay? Maybe we're establishing some kind of a, a basis for genius and how it works. Focus, extreme focus. Just <clears throat> raise a shot. Nothing else. No desires, nothing. Not even breathing. Your heart isn't even beating. Your brain isn't even waving. Just concentration. Mm. Pinpoint. No, I'm not saying that's good or recommended by you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a recommendation for peeps, but it is. Part of the process, when you get to that place, when nothing else is in the way, then it's like direct communication, direct whatever, and it is what it is. It, there's beauty in that. It, there's something ecstatic about that. Okay? Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so direct, it's like a hotline, boom. Straight wire, comment. And so when we are bouncing around these emotional sort of like waves and 
what is it, uh, tides, these tides. And you're being thrown here and there, and then you see your girlfriend or your people, whatever it is, you don't know where things are going to be, and she or he's going through their trip. You don't have any focus. There's nothing there. You're victimized by your addiction to company. Hmm. Some company is great in the service of that. But otherwise, general company has nothing to do with that. So, see? It's what we're talking about. We're talking about practice and the practice of mastery. That is based more on the assumption that you have more work to do, right? And it's not about a search. I'm saying you need to know what that work is because that work has made itself obvious to you. And that's the work that you do because that's what you're being used for because you recognize that and you're okay with that. Say, I'm being used for this. This is arising for me to offer people, to offer humanity. This is my na nature. This is my natural whatever it is. Take it or leave it. This is what I am or what I have to give. See, and so on. Not a problem. If you haven't gotten to that place yet, maybe you work towards having that kind of focus or extreme, let's say, directness with something or other. Yeah. And maybe you have nothing to do with that. You're in the more general field of things where it, it is what it is and it, you have no focus. And maybe that's your destiny. Yeah. Maybe that's as far as a person gets. We're okay with that. No problem. Find your happiness where you are. But if you're disturbed, if you're, you're, you're confused and going through all these crazy changes, you can accept it. If that's your disposition, you enjoy it, it makes you happy, really? <laughs> Keep it. I have some more for you. Take mine. <laughs> Open your bag. I'll fill it up for you. Right? Let those be confused that need to be confused, and then let those be clear who need to be clear. And always from the heart, help, help whoever. As long as it's welcome and you're asked to help, then you have to be of service. Not imposing yourself. Certainly not stoning anybody for getting up and walking out when they have good reason for doing it. <laughs> Before you get to a certain place, let's say, let's call it a place of competence. And it's not a matter of whether you care or not. Okay? It's not about yourself to begin with or at any point, really. Although it applies to the individual, so we can say, yeah, well, that is myself. I'll say, okay, for those who believe that's themselves, okay, fine. No problem, we can tolerate that. Uh, but when you get to a point where, in, in the beginning, you, you're into making mistakes, right? you make mistakes, well, you're learning from that, we hope. Right? But then there's a place where there are no mistakes. And there's no regrets whatsoever. And it's not an attitude change. It's just smooth sailing, and you see the impeccable kind of beauty of that. It's just Almost like perfect. This is what meditation practice brings you to, because deep down inside there is what we call different traditions. We call it different things. The inner master, uh, the spiritual knowingness, and it's it's something else. We have to have the heart, the courage, and maybe maybe an openness to that. Maybe you need to find that yourself. And that might be something worth searching for, but then you can't search for it because it's already here. So the idea then is just to open to it, relax and uh, I can't say anything else about it. You've got to relax and open to it. Yeah. It's good to have an idea of it. It's good to have people around you who are uh, part of that process. Makes it much easier for you to relax and you know where, where it might go for you. Yeah. But nobody can guarantee that you sit down and you relax in your mind. You're, you're going to have the same whatever it is. But chances are, in certain situations, it's much easier to know by association yeah. and so then association can be helpful to some peeps therefore you have the the traditions that you have that are based upon association with those who have a certain realization same with a, a, a musicians association helps yeah. and it helps the assimilation uh, of uh, let's say the data necessary yeah. uh, to get a fuller experience of what what it is that the person that the person is doing or where they're coming from. Yeah. And that has helped a lot of people who, who spend time with me here. Yeah, to see how I'm living, see what I eat. And people need to know what I eat, what I, you know, what I buy, and, uh, 
whatever. And what they're trying to do is put it together for themselves as to, not, not that this is true necessarily, it's not a, a truce particularly, but to see how it works for an individual. Say, doesn't mean it's going to work for you because your karma is different, your tendencies, programs, your culturing, your mind works differently. And so your choices and decisions when you're on the frets or on the stage are going to be relative to your, your karma, your state, say, your momentum, say, your practice, say, your habits, your tendencies, your emotions. And so these, these are factors that have to be weighed carefully. See, how much of what person's karma do you need to take on is part of it. And I want to get to this point. When you reach a certain stage, the heart takes over, and I'm saying it works differently from the mind. Your head, thinking, 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 psychologizing, analyzing, rationalizing, comparing all the time. Say, heart doesn't work that way. Heart is more direct, simple, and very quiet. And true. Now, getting there is really, I guess, the puzzle, the riddle. Yeah. Now, is a sitting practice going to get you there any more than another kind of practice? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe sitting is the worst thing you can do for some. But maybe practicing sitting is the best thing some can do. You need to decide. If you gain more from relaxing into stillness, into beingness relative to nowness, or if this is so discomforting and impossible for you, you feel more peace running around like a chicken without a head. <laughs> Which is also a pass, it's also a message. Because unless you do that and get certain things out of your system, you, you may never be able to sit down. And so it is said in the ancient traditions that you need to burn the seeds of restlessness. They have to be burned up. And then you, you're able to sit down. In other words, this is like an evolutionary stage. Where you, I use the word carefully here. Where you're finished. Where you've completed a certain round. But then it doesn't end. You can leave one round for another round and something else. It doesn't end. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't disappear. Life is here. And it's always going to be demanding, in a manner of speaking. But the ego doesn't really have to complicate it. The heart can have its way. That means it could be smoother sailing relative to the heart's level of functioning. Clearer more openness to more people instead of fixating on one person, which can be a problem. You can have, a, you can have a, a preference to serve a certain person, like parent or something, and that, that's good. That's an obligation which no one will question up to a point. And then it becomes something else after a point, then you might need to see a shrink about it. <laughs> Depending. <laughs> and if you go to a teacher and says, now you got to see a shrink, <laughs> right? We don't do that here. <laughs> right? this, is, this is for already happy people. It's not just for miserable people. You, you go to, first do the medication step. After you finish the medication step, come here. But often you got to do it all together anyway. Well, you got to do the medication while you're, you're sitting in meditation at the same time. See? So we need to know what we need to know. But again, the heart thing is very clear. Whether you need medications or not, the heart thing is the same thing. You get to that with, despite your physical condition, despite your psychophysical condition, the heart thing is, is clear. We can't say it is never, never here. It's always here. So whatever it takes to get in line with that, so that you are in this kind of space of openness, then that's, that's what it is. And as I've said many times in the past, as, as strange as it sounds, I joined the army for God realization, and that's that's easy to say. And what I mean by that is the crunches that I received in the military were prerequisite to my surrendering, in a manner of speaking, and opening 
in the way that I did, which culminated when I got to the Army Band. So there was a process that culminated in the Army Band that resulted in this very profound realization. Uh, we say out of body, out of mind experience, right? Into cosmic kind of experience where my future was revealed to me. I didn't say much about it because that's something which has to show up. It has to happen, and it did happen. And this is part of our clairvoyant nature, which sometimes has, to, like with hard heads like mine was, you have to be shocked. You need an accident, a mishap, see, in order to access it. Uh, whereas for other people, they just have it, it's easy. But with hard heads, you need to be knocked around a little bit, see, jarred, shocked. And that's what practice should do to the more or less, uh, let's say, conventional conditioning shock it, jar it, so that you shake it down, so you can arrive at a naked state, see, a more clear state of consciousness, yeah. where you stop with this, what appears to be cessation of neuroses, right? peace, even for a few moments, to prove the point, that is that peace uh, alien, or is that peace more true to our bones right now? Is it more true to the earth, our earth nature? Heart first. One of the things I discovered when I was a child, when I was drumming, and we would do like long, long drumming, Long drumming, hours, hours of drumming. We had nothing better to do anyway. <laughs> was uh, the effect that the drums had on the breathing, the breathing, maybe just, it happens with athletes, right? When you're exerting yourself a certain way or, or having sex, you know, your breathing changes, your breathing is modified. So playing music, same thing. And if you're playing music as we did, almost like at a marathon level, then your body's and your breathing are altered and you, you can then study how these things interact. Yeah. And I would have these kinds of unique experiences that are typical, let's say, of shamans and peeps like that who are peculiar, no doubt, but it's for real for them, maybe not other peeps. So, you know, other peeps will look at it with the binoculars and say, oh, that's unreal, that's not happening, that can't happen, that's a lot of malarkey. <laughs> well, yeah, for you, you know, from uh, Madison Avenue, maybe it is a lot of malarkey. You know, if you live your life uh, through, uh, you know, books, intellectual sort of musings and so on. Here, we're talking about native peeps where they have access to other kinds of phenomena, quite naturally. And drumming is key and core to these particular kinds of phenomena. Yeah. Throughout all the traditions around the world, the drumming is key. So, as far as drumming goes, I understand that. I'm definitely okay with what they say about the drumming as being a, um, a center for kind, certain kinds of phenomena. Right. And we're talking about then rhythm, absolutely, pulse, heartbeat, universe, cosmic force, primordial cosmic force. So we're messing with primordial cosmic forces when we're drumming say, all the time. So we're in a certain kind of soup then, say, maybe an intergalactic, uh, interdimensional soup, uh, which is part of this process. Getting to a place where you start to see that breathing has something to do with your state of consciousness. Yeah. It can be induced by drumming, it can be induced by other kinds of things, but we're talking about altered states of consciousness relative to breathing, which you can easily produce for yourself by doing pranayama. Discipline yogic breathing. And I became more aware of uh, what was going on in my childhood when I started to study pranayama. The systematic scientific breathing techniques, which are known throughout the world now through, let's say, access to Hindu literature, yogic literature. And it's a form of it. And then you have opera singers that have their own 
breathing techniques. You have other musicians that have their own breathing techniques. So having breathing technology, it's pretty natural for us. It's native to our consciousness. So if somebody in Greece or in some kind of far out place in Hawaii or some other islands in the South Pacific have, have a technology for it, or the Hunas or somebody uh, like that, the mystics of Hawaii have it, say, yeah, yeah, no, this is good. They, they found it because it's native to us. You use breathing techniques to relax yourself. You got to find what works and prove it to yourself and start to access altered states of consciousness and start to expand your awareness. So this is available to anyone out there who is interested in finding, looking into the science and practicing it for themselves. <clears throat> and there are many, 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 many books. Most real comprehensive yoga books and studies have pranayama techniques, say controlling the psychic forces, in other words. And that, that can arise spontaneously. And you can feel you go into a suspended state of consciousness by music or some other kind of activity that causes this kind of resonation say, between the brain, the heart, the body, and the breath say, with, the, with the space, with space, etheric space, and how, how to access resonance with etheric space. And sound is vibration moving through etheric space. <clears throat> but we have to look into it. So we can see that there are many more methods other than just sitting. Uh, you can be lying down, you can be driving and doing this, you can be doing anything and breathing and keeping yourself, say, emotion free, so to speak. Emotionally cool or emotionally intense. It's your choice. Well, what works for you? See? But you don't have to be obsessed and possessed by emotion unless that's what your agenda is. I want to be full of frenzied emotions. See? Yeah. I want to be victimized by my own river of blood patterns of, let's say, uh, unfinished emotional business. 